Hey y'all and welcome back for another video. If you're brand new to the channel, my name is Bianca. I am a clinical pharmacist in the ambulatory care space and I do videos on pharmacy school, residency, life as a pharmacist, all things related to pharmacy along with natural hair, lifestyle, and uh, beauty as well. So if you're interested in any of those topics or if you're just here for pharmacy, I do have a pharmacy playlist so definitely check that out. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into today's video. Get your life, plan it out. All right, so y'all know I always start off the video with the why. Like, why are you doing a video on this topic? And for me, it really hit home this topic after I finished pharmacy school, as I'm practicing pharmacy in different settings. Some of the same things are recurring. And I'm like, wow, like we learned about this in school, but maybe I didn't really realize how important it was. So I hope that by the end of today's video, as a pharmacy school student, as someone pursuing pharmacy, or if you're currently a pharmacist, you'll probably be able to relate with these. I hope that you can take these away and then go back into your curriculum, into your classes, and really pay more attention to it and gain that skill set that you need to be a great pharmacist. So the very first thing that I feel like we learn in pharmacy school, but you really, really want to know, are the treatment guidelines. And more so when I say treatment guidelines, I'm not asking you to memorize from top to bottom every single treatment guideline, but rather where do you go to find different things? So if you get a question about a patient who is on, I don't know, they have diabetes, newly diagnosed, and you need to know what treatment option is recommended, in your head you should be thinking, okay, that's ADA and they're updated however often, every year right if you have a patient with gout you should know to go to the rheumatology website and see what the rheumatology guidelines recommend for treatment options if you have heart failure patients copd you're going to the gold guidelines asthma gina guidelines so that those are a few examples but knowing where to find the answers is more important than knowing what the first line treatment is and let me tell you why in today's day and age the first line treatment may not be the same first line treatment 20, 30 years down the road. And so what I learned even after graduation, it was a year after graduation and guidelines had updated and what I learned and studied for the exam was no longer what they recommended for first line treatment. And so I really believe that knowing what the guidelines, like who governs the guidelines, where do you go to find those answers is going to be more beneficial than knowing what the first line treatment option is. Now, keep in mind, this is for after you graduate. When you're in pharmacy school, please learn the first line treatments because you will be tested on it on your exams. Always <laughs> know your first line treatments and know what the contraindications are to the first line. So you'll know when you need to do second line. But that's the first thing, treatment guidelines. Next up, and by the way, these are not in any order. But next up, I would say know how to use the clinical resources, Lexicom and up to date, Micromedics. I know when I was in pharmacy school in skills lab, we had activities where they would ask us questions about... I don't know, what's that, the renal function cutoff, the creatinine clearance cutoff for this medication? And then you had to go in and see, okay, if their creatinine clearance is less than 30, avoid use. Or patient comes in, they can't swallow pills, where do you look for that information within Lexicon, within up to date? So stuff like that, regardless of what profession you choose as a pharmacist, you're going to get questions, whether it's directly from the patient, the provider, another healthcare profession, and you want to be able to understand, A, you're not always going to know the answers. And that's okay. Like everything is not that much knowledge that can fit in your head. <laughs> and I always tell students, as long as you can find the answer, then that's fine. And if you need to look up the answer, just say, give me one second, let me look into that for you. As a patient, they're going to appreciate you more, even as a provider, they're going to appreciate it more if they know that you actually took, took the time to look it up versus you're just guessing. Say all that to say, just make sure you know where to find the answers for the different questions that may arise. Another great resource that I would say is make sure that you are familiar with the CDC vaccine recommendations. They have a schedule from children, actually from newborns all the way through the elderly, including immunocompromised. So if you have a patient with certain um, predisposed conditions, they have a separate schedule of vaccines versus someone who's healthy versus, you know, the age limits. So make sure you know, A, where to find it, cdc.gov, but also how to apply it. So if it says it's a two-dose series, do you have to go back and repeat dose one? Like things like that. You get a lot of questions about that in the retail setting. So your Walgreens, CVS, 
community pharmacies. However, even as an ambulatory care pharmacist, we have patients coming out of the hospital that have had procedures and now they are immunocompromised. And so I had to go back and make sure while they were in the hospital, they got the vaccines that they needed. Or if they're just asking about, hey, I wanna get the Hep B vaccine or I'm traveling, what does that look like? You wanna make sure you know where to find that on the CDC website and how to read that chart. And I'll put a picture of the chart here for reference. Another thing that I would say become familiar with is your package inserts. So as a pharmacist with new medications, whether you're in the pharmacy or with the patient, or if you have to look it up online, the package insert is going to have a lot of information about storage and um, stability of your item or your product. So how many days out of the fridge, if you have a homeless patient with insulin or an injectable that needs to stay refrigerated, how long before it expires? So that's a really good question that we get often. Um, the number to the company, so if they ever have a manufacturing issue with inhalers, it's really good because it explains step one through however many steps on how to use the device. So if you're teaching someone how to use it, you can go through that and with the patient. The text is really small too, so just imagine trying to look for something and you don't know where you're looking and the patient is sitting right beside you. Like you never want that. Just become familiar with the package insert layout so you know exactly where you need to go to get your information. All right, so I wanna shift away from resources and just talk about general skill sets that you learn in pharmacy school. The first one I would say is effective communication. All schools of pharmacies have the standardized patients or clients built into the curriculum. Whether your school is very heavily focused on that or you get the bare minimum, you do have some type of interaction with a standardized patient. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's basically someone who's hired as a patient and you go in as the pharmacist and you kind of role play. So you're the pharmacist, they're the patient, there's a case and they know what answers to give you when you ask your questions. But in the moment, it seems kind of childish, right? Because you're like, okay, I know this patient is fake. This is not real. This is all like standard. But in the same sense, you are learning how to communicate. A, it's a stranger, so you don't know who they are. B, the case is usually new to you. You don't know what kind of case you're walking into. And so I would encourage you to take those standardized clients very seriously because when you have actual patients, it's going to be very similar to that. You might have a patient that you're talking about something and they go left and you have to redirect them or they're not understanding what you're saying. So you have to explain something to them and break it down in layman terms because they're on a fifth grade reading level. So different scenarios that are presented to you in standardized client cases are actually very relevant and very prevalent. Like you will see them a lot, depending on what practice sites you work at and what patient population you work with. So again, I stress, please take those seriously, but also build your skill set, become more comfortable with making eye contact. Use this time since it is standardized. Um, use this time to really like go through your package insert if you have one in a patient case. Show it to your standardized client and be very interactive. That way you can get the feedback that you need. So once you graduate school and there's no one there to critique you, you know that you're doing a good job. The next thing I would say is make sure that you pay attention when you start learning how to write notes, clinical notes with the SOAP format. So subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. I would say that's probably top three most important things that you want to take away from pharmacy school. In my program, when I was in pharmacy school, we did it a lot in skills lab. The SOAP note format in your assessment and plan, you want to prioritize your plan based on the highest priority. So if they're coming in with a foot infection, although they may also have seasonal allergies, seasonal allergies should not be your number one. Your number one should be the foot infection. So things like that, that was just an example. Um, but subjective versus objective. So is it the patient reporting this or is it a lab that you have? Okay, not going to go into too many details because this is not a skills lab lecture. Um, but in short, make sure that you take away how to write notes. And then once you get in practice, depending on if you're practicing as a solo practitioner or if you're practicing under like a physician, you'll get to learn their style of writing notes and what they prefer. Also, what might be most helpful for you. So as a resident, I was very thorough with my notes because I was the only one looking at them primarily to see my patient the following week. And I needed to be able to remember things like they have a huge birthday celebration coming up. So I know next week if their sugars are higher, I can go back and say, well, it looks like you enjoyed your, your event or what have you. You know, things that relate back to the care for the patient or something that's going to directly relate or affect the patient's labs 
on that follow-up visit. Whereas for a provider, I'm gonna give them a concise one, two, three. This is what we did. We increased the insulin here. We stopped this medication and I'm considering adding this one. So you'll learn all of that as you go into practice. But in short, make sure, not me saying in short after I've talked for five minutes, <laughs> but make sure that you feel comfortable writing notes and you get a lot of feedback and critique from your professors because they've all been in clinical practice and they know exactly what should be in a note. Like you don't want it to be too long, but you also don't want it to be too short. So writing notes is definitely gonna be a top priority for you. All right, y'all, that's the end of today's video. I hope y'all enjoyed it and I hope you're able to take something away from it. Overall, enjoy pharmacy school. Figure out what works for you, what doesn't work. Understand it's okay to make changes, to adjust, to tweak things in your study habits, and all of that good stuff to make sure that you are successful throughout your four years of pharmacy school. And also make sure, from the tips that I shared today, make sure that you get feedback. Like the best time to get feedback is while you're in school, while you're on rotations, so that when you do become a pharmacist, you're more comfortable, you feel strong in those skill sets, and you can be successful as a pharmacist. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. Please leave below in the comments which tip you felt was most relevant or most helpful to you. And also leave any questions that you have. I'll be happy to do additional videos to help y'all answer those questions. I want to apologize to y'all. I know it has been a minute. Like I can't even remember the last pharmacy video I put out. So my apologies. Your girl is still a pharmacist, still love the profession. All the things, I just, I don't know. I fell off with pharmacy videos, but we're back, you know. Other than that, I'll see y'all on my next one. Bye.